you made an inspiration. Um, these Mark are so used to like to repeat. It, you know, like when we read about a uh, uh, Homer type old uh, uh, poet would use certain riffs over yep. and over again. Right. And the, the trouble with you is your fallacy is wrong. He used to use that a lot. My father was a salesman, and uh, he was a high school dropout and dyslexic like Marshall. I, I claim that Marshall is, I believe that Marshall is dyslexic. Right. And, because he never wrote anything, he always, he always uh, dictated either to his wife and then to Mark Stewart. And Phineas Wake's written for dyslexics. I mean, you have to be dyslexic to accept it. <laughs> anyway, my dad used to like to use certain gags over and over again. And it wasn't that the... What made them so funny, what made Marshall so funny, my father so funny, was not the lines, but just the context, when he would come out with a particular line. Yeah, it, because even though he's repeating, now that's what he say, a print person doesn't like a repeated thing because it's mechanical. But an acoustic person, a tactile person, knows that when you repeat something in a different context, it's different. Different, right. Whereas in a print society, it homogenizes, it makes everything be on the same level, then that level rules. It ruled from 1600 to 1900, say. Visual space, flat homogeneous space, flat homogeneous space, that was the context for everything. So repeating something in that context was irritating. That's why when you called me a bastard, it was very sweet. Yes. Well, <laughs> the interesting thing now, now that all times exist, all past, presents, and futures exist, then no medium is obsolete. It's the last line of Take Today. Remember? St. Ronnie mentioned it in the York Symposium. Oh, no. uh, uh, he talks about this and that is obsolete, and then he says, obsolescence is obsolete. Because when we're resonating around an inarticulable situation, then we'll grab on anything, any previous media meme, and celebrate it. Stop. Because in, in all these different media expressions, they are the whole history being replayed in Orphic Baroque spirals of, of affluence uh, because we need them and wealth is the past. We actually live in a situation which is beyond wealth. It's immeasurable. And that is what language has come to. So here I am talking, using verbs to talk about a situation. This is not my personal opinion. This is something that's obvious. If you hear it said to you and, and time is spelled out to make it clear, what I'm saying is quite, makes sense, right? not hard to understand, up to a point. I mean, you're going to bring your soul, personal impression in there and say, well, this and that. But doesn't this make sense? Because yeah. you've lived it. I'm just describing what's, what the weather is. You know, it's cold or it's hot. The internet is neither hot or cold, so what is it? It's not even here. It's the technologies fighting among themselves. Now, that's another aspect that you know, these humans is, is that... Um, uh, Croker, this is the stance that Croker takes. The third school, media ecology. The flesh is sitting on the sidelines. That would be first nature. While the Android meme has come alive, and it's just talking among its parts. So the book writes a book about itself. Movies make movies about themselves. They're all fragmented and can't tell the whole story. So they feed off each other. A book needs to write about whatever movies are doing to people. The news has to write about what other media, including war media, are doing. So everybody's talking about each other, but it's just media memes talking about each other. And flesh is sitting on sidelines. That was tough in the 70s and 80s. That's the big era of Reaganism and, and neoconservatives, in which totally neoconservatism comes in under satellite conditions because the satellite creates an individual autonomous person like a Walkman before the Walkman. You're floating around all previous media, so it makes you feel autonomous. The Western individualism really became extreme under satellite conditions in the 60s and 70s, it became the me decade in the 70s. That is a, a gargantuan a levi um, leviathan on people's sensibilities. They have the bland of the depressing 70s and 80s. Now, what, why was an exuberance in the 90s where people felt free? Because the end remained shrunk, became tiny. And so the hidden ground of that is that our first nature bodies are now walking around where they had been previously, like this quote says, all through history, We've been servo mechanism of our technologies from the beginning of time. Think of the 30s with radio booming. Think of um, uh, movies. Think of telephones. Think of the printing press. That caused 100 years of religious warfare once uh, Luther showed up with a different print version of the Bible. Um, then you have television. It creates a totally different sensibility. These are massive environments that affect whole cultures. If they shrink, then we get to the point that we're not being affected by media. At least the Internet makes us feel that. 
The characteristics of the internet is to become so in tiny and miniaturized that the human being, the body that the technology came from, feels autonomous, free of media for the first time. And as I said, you know, an hour ago on the Public Culture Express now. But this is the point of his book, that we're now free. If we understand uh, McLuhan, though he does know it's McLuhan, we then would be detached or not worried about the torrent of images. He gets about halfway into that insight. And the point is he just gets to 1952 in a mechanical bride. That's, that's where he's gotten in the clue and understanding. All right? So if you want to know what I'm talking about, you have to understand Finnegan's Wake. You have to know how to read it. That's what McLuhan was doing. For a book, for POBs, he said, I'm going to save your bloody medium, because I'm going to say the best uh, combination of that was Finnegan's Wake, and that book should be here forever. It's the greatest book ever lived. And he said it was in Newsweek in 1966. He said it's the greatest inventory of media effects. Okay, so he's preserving a book. Um, so if you're a book culture, which we are, and we, I don't know if the whole world will ever become a book culture, because they're going to come in from other sensibilities, and now we're in the discarnate uh, Android meme, uh, tactile simulation world. Are the Chinese going to be literate like we were? I don't know. Um, though media shrinks, it does enhance individuality. The whole world is yours. You know what I mean? It's, it's, the movie made the whole world your oyster, but um, the internet makes the whole world editable by you. <clears throat> Ed is a pun on editable. He meant editable spaceships. You can edit your reality. You can edit and interact with it and control the, these huge media miners. So. <laughs> We are now confronting the body that it all came from, right? So, if I look at you, Mike, and I say, um, what language do we speak? And uh, you're a stranger, and I'm really aware, I'm really aware of we all... We don't speak the same language, Bob. Hmm? We don't speak the same language. I, well, that's the practice of consciousness, first nature coming up. Because, um, what do I say to you... Uh, since I know you've been programmed by your own culture, plus all these media environments, plus the internet, and I have, and I know I can edit my own solipsistic bubble within it, then where is a matchable thing? Where, where can we match and begin uh, connecting with ESP? Probably we won't even care. Because you can talk to yourself through these air sats mirrors of yourself, all these media. So we're, gonna, we're going to solipsistic bubbles, but we still have to deal with how we're going to relate to each other. What's going to be the new Esperanto? Remember, fitting his wake as a satire and making Esperanto. What's going to be the new uh, language um, that, that, that people can share? We may not need to share anymore. So it's the ultimate <coughs> autonomy, ultimate anarchy. And that is a threat to cultures that are tribal, who, for whatever technological evolutionary point they're at, and they really still believe in, in uh, tribalism, then we have a literate culture that en enhanced individuality. And then the Internet creates a tactile individuality. An error doesn't have a tactile individuality pass through literacy. They had manuscript culture, but they didn't have industrial literacy. And McLuhan said the Gutenberg Galaxy is not just print, it's the railroad lines, it's the straight streets we have, the, the school chairs. The whole environment is linear, not just a book. So we are now having a mimic battle between um, a meme that believes that there's a shared space and another mean that is experiencing a non-shared space. The S, the East versus the West, or the clash of civilizations. It should be the clash of means which are mythic, mythic as real environments, mythic stages is what we're fighting. And what is fighting? So we're standing here watching George Bush uh, declare war on himself, all right, uh, because it can only be one thing, but it's not a human being declaring war, it's the android being having his crisis and dying and arguing among its parts. Any questions? <laughs> <laughs>